Welcome to Soccer Morning on World Soccer Talk. Here's your host, Jason Davis. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome into Soccer Morning right here on WorldSoccerTalk.com. Very happy to have you. Head of a big weekend. Man, look at the schedule. Look at the fixture list, whatever you would like to call it. There are uh, things happening, game, big games all over the globe in the United States, in England, on the continent. We'll touch on some of that, look ahead to the schedule this weekend. But first, let me set up today's excellent guest, Andrew Orsati, spokesperson for FIFA Pro, the world football organization representing the players, will join us today. Is uh, there's a statement out, some information from FIFA Pro uh, regarding their wishes when it comes to the FIFA presidential race, the election coming up on Feb- uh, February 26th. Numerous candidates. In fact, we've got one more candidate in the field uh, as of today. As a matter of fact, we'll talk to Andrew about what FIFA Pro would like to see out of this FIFA presidential election and the guidelines which they have set forth um, that they believe are important for the direction of the world's game let's do let's set up that interview with some news ahead of andrew orsati let's go first to minnesota minnesota united stadium deal expected to be announced today at noon eastern time in many i'm sorry in saint paul where the team will uh, build a stadium for their launch in 2018 obviously uh, originally planned to build their stadium in minneapolis that deal fell through an alternative opportunity presented itself in St. Paul and now all parties seem to be on board there's a lot of reporting out of uh, Minnesota that says the uh, announcement will be made today here you go St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman's office has rented an event center on uh, blah 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 for a 1 p.m. Uh, event Friday excuse me that's central time so it's actually 2 p.m. here let me get my time zones right the mayor and Minnesota United FC team owner Bill McGuire expected to announce that a professional soccer stadium will be built just off a of university in Snelling Avenues on vacant property owned by the Metropolitan Council. This is um, uh, this is a, a location many people in Minnesota have said would be a fine place to build a stadium. Uh, Friday's announcement will represent a bit of a turnaround for the nation's premier soccer league and Minnesota United, which had their sights set seven months ago on Minneapolis. Uh, let's see. Unlike the Minneapolis location, the 10-acre bus barn site in St. Paul's Midway has been off the tax rolls for 50 years or longer. Uh, the location is prime, located within sight of busy Interstate 94 and stops along uh, public transportation there in St. Paul. So big news out of Minnesota when there was some doubt as to whether this would get done. It seems that that is all gone and the team will get their stadium site sorted. Speaking of the FIFA presidential election, Jerome Champagne, the Frenchman who previously tried to run against Sepp Blatter the last time we had a FIFA presidential election has entered the race, has announced that he has submitted his letter and the requisite nominations, which he did not receive the last time around. Uh, he says, I sent my application letter and eight, uh, eight, nomination, eight nomination letters to FIFA on Monday night. It's an exciting mission. He joins Michel Platini, Prince Ali Ben Al Hussein. David Nakid and former a former Trinidad and Tobago player in meeting the deadline uh, for Monday's deadline for entering the race. We've seen several other names be bandied about, and we'll get into some of those with Andrew Orsati. Um, the field is large. The question is whether or not FIFA will actually be reforming itself under a new FIFA president, or if it will be business as usual. Uh, Champagne is a former French diplomat who's been working in football. Obviously, the requirement from FIFA is you have to have been working in in soccer for the last five years, something ridiculous like that, in order to even be considered for the FIFA presidency. Yesterday, Europa League action. Yep, that happened. Borussia Dortmund, 3-1 winners over Karabag. Karabag? Kabbalah. Kabbalah in Azerbaijan. Something I breezed by yesterday when we talked to Ross Dunbar that probably deserves some further examination is the fact that Dortmund did have to leave uh, Mkhitaryan behind because of the political situation there in Azerbaijan. And, uh, you know, look, they're, they're on the surface, it seems like, okay, whatever. But it's 
it's obviously setting a very poor precedent if players are forced to be left behind because of political situations. If soccer is meant to be a political, um, it's never it never is. But it certainly should be from a competitive standpoint, a political in the sense that players should be allowed to play, uh, no matter where their team is going. Also in the uh, Europa League yesterday, uh, you had Anderlecht coming back, getting a late winner, beating Tottenham Hotspur two to one. Schalke two two draw with Sparta Prague, Liverpool in their first European match under new manager Jurgen Klopp with a 1-1 draw against Ruben Kazan. A little disappointing. Ruben Kazan went down to 10 men. Liverpool unable to make that advantage count. We've got a lot of games coming up the weekend. I've already told you about that. Just a taste. Today, you have German action, Hoffenheim and Hamburg on Fox Sports 2 at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. You've got uh, La Liga, Raya Vallecano and Espanol at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on BN Sport. Uh, tomorrow, you've got Bayer Leverkusen and Stuttgart. You've got West Ham Chelsea at 10 a.m. Eastern on NBC SN. Uh, you've got uh, several other big games, uh, Arsenal and Everton on NBC proper at 12.30 p.m. And just going down the list here. Uh, Sunday, obviously a big day in American soccer with MLS and Decision Day. You also have Sunderland and Newcastle, so the Tyneware Derby at uh, 8 a.m. Eastern on NBC SN Juventus Atalanta on BN Sport at 10. Borussia Dortmund Augsburg on Fox Sports 2 at 10.30. Uh, Liverpool Southampton 12.15 on NBC. Mönchengladbach and Schalke at 12.30 12, uh, 12 p.m. on Fox Sports 1. Uh, Barcelona plays at 1.15 on BN Sport against Ibar. Many, many other games uh, on the schedule. Check it out. All right. In uh, Back in American sport, uh, Soccer News, Sporting Kansas City has announced their USL team for 2016. Uh, they will be called the Swope Park Rangers. Swope Park is the municipal park where K uh, Sporting Kansas City actually has their training facilities. This name, while obviously derivative of Queens Park Rangers, goes back to 2008 when, when the fans of Sporting Kansas City, then the Kansas City Wizards, christened their reserve side the Swope Park Rangers because of the location where they played their matches. Uh, so I'm not going to be too harsh on the derivative nature of the name. Actually, very cool that the team adopted something that the fans created uh, seven years ago. The United States U-17s face a crucial match tonight in the U-17 World Cup in Chile. They'll face the hosts in Group A, the winner likely to move on to the knockout round with uh, third-place teams advancing. Right now, the United States is on one point, having lost to Nigeria 2-0 in their opener and drawn with Croatia 2-2 in their second match. That game against Chile is at uh, 8 p.m. local time. I don't, have the con I don't have the conversion. Trevor will have to get on that. And I, I believe that game and all of the U-17 games have been played on NBC Universo, uh, which you probably have on your, on your direct TV or cable if you really look hard enough. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we will set it up. Andrew Orsati, spokesperson for FIFA Pro, will join us. We'll talk about the FIFA elections and what FIFA Pro would like to see. Soccer Morning, WorldSoccerTalk.com. Face in the crowd. You're talking too loud. But I can't hear you During the past few months, we've created a new weekend tradition which includes watching your favorite MLS team play on TV, muting the broadcast, heading over to Rabble.tv to hear my audio during the game, and then drinking a cold beverage as we spend 90 minutes together discussing our favorite league. For this Sunday, I'd like to personally invite you to join me and Jared Dubois as we bring you the final day of the MLS regular season. From 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern, Jared and I will be talking through the DC United against Columbus Crew finale, but we'll also be keeping a close eye on all of the other games where we'll be updating you on the key developments as they happen. With Rabble, the concept is simple. All you have to do is tune into the DC United Against Crew game on TV, press the mute button, and head on over to Rabble.tv to listen to me and Jared on your desktop, through your iOS, Android app, or through your mobile browser. Plus, before and during the games, you can join in by posting your questions or observations in the comments section. And why don't you create your own broadcast, call one of your team's games. It's easy. Sign up for free today and try it out. Join me and Jared this Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern at Rabble.tv, where it's your team and your call. During the past...
Welcome back to Soccer Morning on World Soccer Talk with Jason Davis. It is a good thing that it's Friday and I'm in a good mood because some things just, you know, they happen. You're doing a live show, you have a plan, and said plan falls apart. In this case, Andrew Orsati pulled away for something uh, that uh, was more important than joining Soccer Morning, which I can understand, and that means we will not be talking to the spokesperson for FIFPRO right now we're working on it we'll talk to we'll let you know if we're able to get mr orsati on the show to talk about fifa's uh, fifa's position regarding the fifa presidential race i myself was perhaps also going to ask if mr orsati and fifa had a position on the situation with henrik mkhitaryan the player that the armenian player who did not travel to azerbaijan for borussia dortmund's europa league match because of death threats uh, despite some some uh, assurances from the Azerbaijanis that they could keep him safe. The team ultimately decided that they weren't going to take him because it was just too dangerous. And that's terrible. And that's not something we can happen. There's some bad things that have popped up in my news feed recently. I don't know if we want to talk about, again, it's Friday, lots of games coming up, very exciting times, uh, both in England, on the continent, and in uh, North America with MLS and Decision Day on Sunday. Anything on your mind on a Friday, we have opened up the phone lines, 646-832-3909. I want to talk to you. We want to talk to you about whatever you're looking forward to this weekend, whatever's top of mind. Again, this issue with Mkhitaryan is top of mind for me. Another thing top of mind, and I failed to mention it in the news, and I apologize profusely for this. But I'm looking at a piece um, at The Guardian by Sid Lowe. Line's been told to quote, uh, line's been quote, Told to favor Real Madrid, unquote, in next week's uh, next month's Clasico against Barcelona. Uh, a Spanish referee, lines person, has said uh, that he has been told. He has reported that he has been he was told to favor Real Madrid. The linesman alleged he was told by officials, uh, told that officials had already acted to influence the outcome of games, and that another linesman had been subjected to similar pressures. Linesman said he did not want to be identified because of concerns over possible reprisals but he made a formal complaint through a lawyer to the anti-corruption investigating magistrate in Barcelona, in which he claimed to have been told to favor Madrid, first by another official and then over the phone by a member of the Spanish Football Federation's Referees Committee. Now, this may not be an issue of match fixers involving themselves in the Clasico. This may may not be about uh, betting concerns in Singapore and Southeast Asia putting a lot of money on Real Madrid. Uh, It may not be that. It may just be internal pressure to, I don't know, favor Real Madrid uh, within Spanish football. Um, There there may be some anti-Barcelona feelings. This may have something to do with the the Catalan independence movement. I mean, there's a million possibilities here. I don't know which one it is. But regardless, it's match match fixing. I mean, it doesn't matter what the pressures are, what... Uh, what mechanism is used to change the outcome of a game? It's match fixing, plain and simple. The story was broken by the Catalan newspaper Les Sportiu on Wednesday and followed by uh, Cadena Cope radio station. It's had a huge impact in Spain, even if there are doubts anything will come of it. The formal complaint made by the Leisman through his lawyer, dated 19 October, has been published. In it, the linesman recognizes a telephone conversation, in, he says, took place, uh, was not recorded, and that there is no concrete proof of it, but he hopes the other linesman will also come forward. Jose Angel Jimenez Munoz, who is reported as the referee's committee member, accused of having made the telephone call to the linesman, said on Wednesday night that he had not yet had the chance to read the complaint, but said of the allegations, I have no idea where they come from. It is like something out of a Kafka novel. Barcelona's vice president, Susana Monje said, I hope it does not prove to be true. I mean, this is, and here's the problem, I think. This is probably going to go away pretty quickly. I mean, there may be some movement in the buildup. There may be some movement within Spanish football to address something. But if this is a hearsay situation, this is a linesman making an accusation based on phone calls that are, there's no concrete proof. There's no way for him to bring forward direct evidence that this that this phone call happened and that he was pressured to favor Madrid. So it, it may be easy 
for the parties involved, including Jose Angel Jimenez Munoz, to say, you got nothing on me. I didn't do anything. And everybody moves on. The linesman who forms one part of the officiating teams that could be chosen. So it's not even, it's not even that he had already been chosen for the classical. He was just on the list alleges that an official spoke to him in September and suggested that should he be given the chance to officiate, he should seek to influence the game in Madrid's favor. The linesman was allegedly told the order had come from, quote, someone inside the refereeing authorities, and that it was better for the linesman to try to fix the game than a, refer- uh, than a referee as the lead official is subject to greater me- media scrutiny. So we're now we're even getting into, let's be slick about fixing the match. We know that the center referee is going to have more scrutiny. We know that the center referee has a greater spotlight on him. If he changes the game, there will be a lot of allegations that something untoward is happening. But if a linesman changes the game, hmm, maybe nobody notices. Maybe it's just another linesman making another poor call. And this all feeds into our problem with the game right now. One of the running themes of Soccer Morning, and I know that it's weird for me to talk about this considering we are all passionate about this sport. We love it. We watch it all the time. We, are, we, we consume football as like ravenous beasts. But we have to do this mental dance. We have to, do, we have to go through the cognitive dissonance of watching these matches and, ha- and in that moment, believing everything is fair, believing everything is right, believing that this is purely about the com- competition on the field and the relative strengths of the two teams and not about match fixing. Because now I'm thinking, hmm, if they've, do- if they've done this for the Classico, now the biggest match in Spain, one of the biggest matches in the world, if not the biggest. So maybe that, maybe that indicates they're not going to, that, that this is so important that that's why there's pressure. But if they're going to fix the Classico, or they're going to put pressure on a linesman to favor a team. How do we know this hasn't happened a thousand times before? How do we know this isn't happening in every La Liga match? How do we know it's not happening all over the place? I mean, this is a Spanish issue right now, but we obviously know what the situation was in Italy time and again. If there is the chance that there's match fixing involved. I mean, it, it just spoils everything. So again, we, we have to uh, we have to go through that process of sitting down, watching the game, and forgetting that all of this stuff is happening, or or could be happening, or could be in. I mean, if you wanted to be cynical about it, you could legitimately throw match fixing out at every single game you watch. That's a tragedy. I mean. Okay, it's not it's not a tragedy in the sense of the loss of human life, but this is the world's most popular sport. This is a game that inflames passions around the globe. This is a game that I've chosen to center my life around, my professional life around. We do this show. Trevor and I don't sit here every day, put together soccer morning, and go on the air because, oh, it's just a thing to do. We don't line this thing up every day go through the pain of having guests who have to cancel on us in the last minute because, you know, it's just as good as anything else. This is, this is what we, this is what we care about. And this is what you care about. This is why you listen. Uh, ah, I'm unbelievable. I'm sorry. I know that got ranty. Just the, the, just the frustration you feel. Again, sitting down, going to a game. I mean, think about the people. Think about that guy. He lives in Nebraska. He lives in Florida. He lives in, in Colombia. He lives in Brazil. He lives wherever. And it's always been his dream. He lives in Asia. He lives in Japan. He lives in China. It's always been his dream to attend El Clasico. Always been his dream. He lines up the money. He buys his plane ticket. He gets his accommodations. He's gonna. He sets aside the, the time from work. He's making his pil- pilgrimage. That's 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 the level that soccer and football has risen to in the world. It, it, it's a pilgrimage. 
when you go to a place like Spain to see El Clasico, whether it's the Bernabeu or the Camp Nou, this is this is your it, it, it's it's not religion. I'm not trying to be sacrilegious here, but it is that important to people. That guy goes to the game. I mean, he may never know. Okay, he may still enjoy his time. It could still be the greatest moment of his life to go watch this this game, no matter what the outcome, no matter if a referee changes the game for Real Madrid or not. But if that guy, I mean, does that guy matter? I mean, does that guy matter? And again, this is so subtle. That's the that's the troubling thing. If this was some guy again some guy in in southeast asia exerting pressure because of betting markets if there was money being thrown around if this was raj paramal or whatever his name is wilson Ra, raj wilson paramal yeah if this was that guy doing wilson raj that thing you know at least we could compartmentalize that this is criminals doing criminal stuff bad criminals let's catch them and put them in jail this I mean, it's definitely a crime. Don't get me wrong. But this is so subtle. This is so, this is just the, the smallest. I mean, again, if you want to be cynical, you could even draw this out and, and imagine this happening in all kinds of sports. I mean, I don't think American sports are immune from this. We've had point shaving scandals in the past. We've had a referee, Tim Donahue, in the NBA who was clearly manipulating games for his own benefit. How do we know that there aren't referees? And that's the thing. This is the compact we make with them. Or, or with human beings in general. We have to trust that you're going to act appropriately. You're going to do the right thing. Otherwise, the whole system falls apart. Now we can't believe anything. We might as well go home. You want to watch real soccer that doesn't have any potential for any of this nonsense? Go round up 22 friends and hit the field and play the game. Call your own fouls. I don't know. Because that's the only way we can be sure that there's not something hideous happening within the sport. Ah. Uh, my friend, uh, Auntie in uh, Finland, asking about the hurricane in Mexico and any effect on Liga MX. I am not aware of that. We should check on that. Maybe we should hit up uh, our friends Eric Gomez and Tom Marshall, ask them what's coming down there. Uh, I just saw this morning headline, the, the highest uh, or the most uh, powerful storm, recorded storm in Western Hemisphere history is going to hit Mexico uh, as Hurricane Patricia comes up um, from the from the Pacific Ocean, I hope everything's safe. I mean, let's forget about football. Who cares about that? Let's be safe uh, when it comes to to hurricanes hitting countries. Six four six eight three two thirty nine zero nine. Get me off of this thing. Get me off of match fixing, please, please. I don't I don't want to talk about it anymore. I want to talk about something positive. Talk about decision day. Talk about the Manchester Derby. 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 We're talking about uh, Quadro Poku being chased by numerous teams, according to reports. Eric Winalda, who obviously uh, coached and, and knows, uh, knows Quadro Poku from his time in Atlanta, says eight teams are pursuing him. Eight teams per- in Europe. So it's a, it's a matter of how long Poku's here. Not necessarily if he goes, if that's true. Uh, I believe this was also backed up by our friend uh, D- uh, Dave Martinez at Empire Soccer, who reported the same thing, uh, working from Eric Winalda's uh, interest. But there was also a possibility of Poku being traded to the Union this summer. That almost happened. Empire of Soccer has learned that Poku nearly made, it, uh, made a move to the City of Brotherly Love as early as this July. Poku came very close to joining the union in the second in a secondary MLS trade window just prior to the arrivals of Bo Pirlo and Lampard. Curtin and Jason Kreis were the ones involved in that potential trade. That would have been huge for, for Philadelphia. Man, can you imagine how popular Quadro Poku would be in Philadelphia? Pablo, you're on the air. Hey, Jason, how are you? Happy Friday. Happy Friday, Pablo. Uh, raise my spirits. I'm talking about match fixing. It makes me sad. You know, I do made me sad as well. I was I wanted to talk about, you know, exciting weekend uh for MLS playoffs, but um I mean you're totally right. On the match fixing it's just it's just a big bummer. I'm a you know, like um everyone had always like when I grew up I 
especially Madrid Barcelona games, there was always conspiracy theories. You know, everyone favors Madrid or this or that. And I always took, took him like, you know, you're crazy people. What, what are you talking about? This is a beautiful sport. This doesn't happen. There's always mistakes, error, you know, human mistakes in the game, but this just definitely uh, brings you down. Do you think, um, do you think Pablo, that, that uh, as Americans, we're naive about this stuff sometimes? Again, we've had a couple of scandals in American sports. Nothing really made, I mean, nothing so big uh, that it made us question everything. It was always like these lone rogue elements, whether it's uh, the mob with the BC point shaving scandal or Tim Donahue acting of his own accord. Do you think we're naive about this stuff? That's a very good question. I actually think so. And uh, specifically because across the world, soccer is, it's more than a sport. You know, here we, of course, sports, we see Americans see sports more than, you know, bigger things, but we, we see it as a competitive issue. Whereas in Europe, for example, as, as you were saying, I mean, like the Madrid, uh, Barcelona classical is more than a sport. It, yeah. It's involved in this uh, culture, politics, society. Yeah. And when you get all these powerful forces, uh, surrounded in the match, I mean, there's always room for any type of pressure or any type of, you know, match fixing yeah. what's going on in Spain right now with uh, the Barcelona separatist movement and, and, um, um, Madrid's, uh, 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 intent to try to stop it. I understand there's pressure, you know, there's a big pressure for that. What happens in Eastern Europe, the same thing. There's, there's a lot of forces that are part of the game and abroad. They're not only sports they're, or economic, they're definitely political and, and that's intertwined with that race. And I think that's a great and beautiful thing about American soccer mm. that it, we tend to separate those two issues, but that is not how it happens across the world. All right, Pablo, so you want to talk about MLS. Uh, what's on your mind for decision day? Just, just excited for DC United. Um, I know we don't have a sexy team. I know we don't have a sexy stadium, sexy, you know, um, uh, environment, but I am actually excited about this, uh, this opportunity. I'm not saying we're going to make it uh, be the champions, but I, th- I think we have a, a good shot that, we, that we're playing and, uh, the way MLS can go through. In, a powerful team of strong teams, but um, like Kansas or other teams, but they're they're not playing well right now. So I think yeah. we we have a good shot. Oh, it's it's a wide open field, absolutely for anybody who can find a bit of a stride. DC United in Columbus on Sunday uh, with a chance to solidify that second spot, get the buy into the semifinal round, facing a, a Crew SC team, Pablo, without Kai Kamara and and Federico Iguain. That's a big boost for DC. It is, and then if we get it, you know, they'll have the momentum going on, and momentum is a big part in any playoff run. So I think uh, we, we have a good chance. And but as a DC United fan, I'm telling you the truth, man, I'm a bit uh, just passive right now. I'm waiting for the new stadium to yeah. come online. I yeah. think being living in DC for a long time that that will revolutionize the way that soccer is viewed here in this city, which is a big soccer city. It's just they haven't reached out to it, and building a stadium in Buzzard Point uh, will attract so many fans. I think it's going to be one of the best environments in MLS. I, look, look, I, I've, I've had reason over the, the summer to spend some time down there in that general area where the baseball stadium is and uh, the Navy Yard area and uh, the, the, you know, the south, uh, southeast waterfront. And it's, it's booming. I mean, it's booming. Maybe it's gentrification. Maybe it's a little too yuppie for some people's taste. But it's, it's a pretty great place to hang out. And there's some pretty cool stuff happening down there. If they can get that stadium in that general region, yeah, it would be, it would be great, Pablo. I can see something like the march that Seattle fans have from the metro down yeah. to the stadium. You pass all these restaurants, all these breweries, yeah. all these. Yeah. I can see that happening. And and again, DC, DC uh, uh, is soccer city in many ways, international city. So I think this would this you know people forget about DC United, understandably because we've been a boring team over the past years. But <laughs> but I think that's going to change the way that yeah. soccer is viewed here in, in the city for sure. We're just waiting for them to finish the red tape, Pablo, and get the. I know eminent domain has been has been brought up recently. I haven't really been following the the events in the DC government when it comes to getting that land so they can build this stadium. There seems to be enough momentum. We know that Mayor, Mayor Bowser is behind this, so hopefully it gets done, Pablo. I I'm really cross. I I think I'm with you, man. I. I I think this would be one of the best environments in the league. If they can figure out a way to make the stands bounce in this new place, fantastic. I agree. Again, with the purchasing power that DC residents have over other places, I just I, I can see this being a you know big uh, economic issue. The people are just going to come in and they're, uh, they're going to be sold out and everything. I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping that, but we'll see what happens. But All thanks right. for the show, man. Have a Appreciate good weekend it. and. Don't be sad about match fixing. Uh, Things will get a result one day. Let's just, <laughs> yeah, let's pretend it's, thanks for the call, Pablo. Let's pretend it's not happening. I'm just going to imagine that MLS is completely uh, separate from all of this nonsense. It's not happening, at least for my league. 
And then I'll watch the Premier League. Who knows? Mark Fishkin on the line. Hey, Mark. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, sir. All right, Mark. So what's on your mind? Well, first of all, did, did Pablo say that D.C. is a soccer town that somehow has forgotten about D.C. United? I don't know. I'm, I'm scratching my head a little bit about uh, that. But yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't call to troll. Didn't call to troll. Um, with news that uh, the, the Minneapolis, or excuse me, the St. Paul Stadium looks like it's going to be a reality. And then the news earlier this week that Tim Laiwiki is joining his buddy Bex in Miami, which should lock that up. That That gets MLS to the... 24 clubs that they had hoped to get to by now. But obviously there's a lot more interest out there. And I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on who's next, because I, I would imagine that you know, now, they're, now they're at 24, the next stop will be 28. And so yeah. I'm just kind of curious who you think, and we can certainly chat about it, what cities might be right for future expansion, I, if I, only to anger NASL guys even more. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it, it, so much of it is, is really just throwing darts at a board or, or at least, you know, here's a city that fits the basic criteria. We could imagine it as a successful soccer town. Uh, they may have the political will to build a stadium. The question is whether or not they have the ownership behind it. I mean, I, I think places like uh, I think Charlotte makes a lot of sense. I don't know how close anything is there. I don't know that there's anybody with any money who's stepping up to, to make Charlotte a possibility, but I think Charlotte makes a lot of sense. It continues that southern trend that MLS has gone with with Atlanta and focusing on Miami. Um, St. Louis, everybody loves St. Louis. I'm sort of down on St. Louis as a town right now for a lot of reasons, Mark, but yeah. it, it, soccer-wise, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't like, and, I, and I, I'm on the record, I don't like this in Atlanta. No matter how great they've done so far, 24,000 season ticket deposit, that's that's brilliant. It, it's probably going to be a success. I'm not a fan of the shared stadium situation with an NFL team. Um, no matter how much consideration you give the soccer club with the sheets and the you know, more intimate atmosphere stuff, I, I'm just not a big fan. But that seems to be the direction things are headed in St. Louis. Uh, beyond that, I don't think Vegas is ever going to happen. Uh, well, Sa Sacramento has to be on the top of the list. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they do. Right? They you do. I have questions. Uh, Sacramento has proven itself to be a, a, a great top-level soccer market in waiting, okay, just by the fact that they've sold so many tickets and gotten so many people out and excited about a USL team. That's brilliant. They have one of the best uh, uh, logos in, in, in American soccer. I'm, I'm still a big fan of that. <laughs> but remember, and this is the thing that I'm not sure about, and, and I'm waiting for people who know more, and, and I follow uh, Evan Ream, who's out there in Sacramento covering soccer yep. on Twitter. Yep. And I'll, you know, he seems to think it's not a big deal, but the Kevin Johnson factor to me is something we're not talking about. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Kevin Johnson, former NBA player, started with his Phoenix Suns in the 90s, current mayor of Sacramento, two terms, announced he's not running for a third term recently, by the way. He's the driving force behind get, keeping the Sacramento Kings in that town, getting something like $500 million of public funds to help build them a new re arena. He is also very involved and, and very supportive of the, of the MLS bid. But he's not a nice guy, and there's a lot of things that have been following him and uh, he's got, there's a lot of questions about how he's used some of those public resources and his own personal, uh, campaigns for various causes. I, I, I don't think it's going to stick to, to, to the MLS team that they're involved with Kevin Johnson. What do you do? You get, you, you get the mayor on your side, no matter who it is, but I don't know if that's going to prolong things a little bit, Mark. Well, okay. I think that that's totally valid. I think Sacramento checks a lot of boxes in terms of the model for successful well, okay. MLS franchises, right? Smaller right. town. There's not a ton of competition they, they are from other the... pro sports there. They've got ownership. They can get, you know, they've already pitched, right? So yes. uh, the yeah. guys in, in 425th Avenue understand everything um, that Sacramento can bring, and they just didn't make the cut this time around. Well, yeah, um, I, 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 You're going to run out of gigantic markets eventually, the, the biggest, the top 10, top 12, top 15, whatever. You're, you, I don't know if the MLS is, is not in any of the top 10 markets, but there might, there might be one or two. Um, yeah. And as you said, it, very much in the Orlando-Portland type of model, right? Uh, as you said, not a whole lot of competition in terms of Major League Sports can, can sort of get, along the, get on the front page alongside the Kings. Um, but what, right. that kind of brings me to a question, and, and you being a New York guy, I mean, I, I imagine you might have some thoughts on this. Do you think MLS, do you think that's what MLS wants? I mean, do you think MLS wants to go into those places because they will be locally successful? Because I, I feel as though 
they may be comfortable with a lot of their local success in places like Salt Lake City, um, uh, certainly Can- uh, Kansas City, places like that. What's next is that national footprint and turning MLS into a TV product. And I don't know that Sacramento well, gets you there. Yeah, I mean, let, let's take a look at the list of markets, which I've pulled up on my internet machine. And, the, the you know, the holes right now are Detroit, which, I mean, I know there's a very successful fourth division team on a minute scale out there. I don't, I don't know. And I mean, no disrespect for anyone there, but it's obviously a, a challenging market. Um, and Phoenix, which I don't know if there's ownership in place. I don't know how necessarily you can play there. It's too hot. It's just too hot in the, in the summer. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then you've got Tampa, which they've tried once before and is, um, a, pretty poor pro sports town to be, to be frank. And another top 10 uh, top 20 markets. I mean, Cleveland, eh, you're already in Orlando and Sacramento's 20. So, you know, the, a lot of their bases are covered. They've just signed their long-term TV contract, right? Which, which will take them at least through this next wave of expansion. But it's interesting to think about Charlotte's 25th Indy's 26th. Um, and I know obviously, um, you know, Peter World and team have done a fantastic job with their NASL franchise there. I think they're leading that league in attendance. Um, certainly a multiple of what's drawn on Long Island right now. So, you know, just want to talk about more teams and yeah. uh, throw some positive juju at you. I mean, if we're, if we're about your I appreciate right it, Mark. And expansion is always fun. You know, if, if we're talking about, you know, w- dreaming, we're just dreaming. Not, I'm, not ask, I'm not applying any real world metrics to these, to these choices. I've always thought, and I don't think it's I don't think it's a soccer town by any stretch of the imagination. But if you could find some way to get excitement going and, and grab people, d- doesn't Pittsburgh sound like a kind of place where it would be fun to have a soccer team? Just because of the I know it's it's more more a high tech town now than it used to be. But does that 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 blue collar ethic and what the Steelers bring to the end? Don't you feel like that would be cool for soccer? I think it would be great. I mean, I know their their small club, which has that jewel of a stadium right on the river, is terrific. I, I don't. I don't think they they draw too. I mean, Pittsburgh would be great. I think the question is, you know, given blah blah changing demographics and everything we yeah. hear, and and uh, raise my hand, not familiar with uh, the demographics in Pittsburgh. It's a lovely city. It's a very livable city. Agreed, it's becoming a young tech hub. I don't know that the that the Rust Belt is the place for growth of this game. Although, if right. we're truly going to be an American game, it's got to it's right. got to do well. There, right. Right? It's got to it's got to be in the South. It's got to be on the West Coast. In 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 obviously, I mean, San Francisco is a place. I know San Jose's right there down the road. But I, a lot of people will no, tell it's you not, it's it, it's not right down the road. Well, and that's the problem, okay, right? That, right. It's I mean, we're talking fifty miles away, right, and right, right. there it's a two-hour drive. Well, so. to that to that to that point, I mean, it, it's sort of like saying, "Oh, uh, DC United is Baltimore's team." Of, co- of course, that's not true. Uh, Baltimore is another place that I think would be very fun to have a team. Number 26 on that list, by the way. Uh, Mark, yep. anything else before I let you go? Thanks for the call, man. Yeah, no no problem. Happy weekend. Enjoy decision day. Good luck. And, good luck to uh, your Red Bulls we'll on talk Sunday. talk to you next week. Okay, good luck to your Red Bulls on Sunday, Mark. All right, thanks, All right, man. There Bye-bye. you go. Mark Fishkin, uh, host of Seeing Red right here on uh, Backhill.com, which you can listen to about all things New York Red Bulls and New York soccer and MLS in general. Ray, Milwaukee, you're on the air. Hey, what's up, man? Um, I would just like to say that uh, about the CCL draw is uh, Taylor Twelman going to tweet out a a fake number of salary gap between MLS and Central American teams. Okay, that's a joke. Well, I I don't Um, I don't don't, don't know what you're referring to. Uh, I must have missed it. Well, last year. Oh, when they, they lost okay. in the championship yeah. game, that, he tweeted out some fake numbers between Liga MX teams and uh, MLS okay. well, teams. Why do you say they're fake, uh, Ray? Uh, because uh, Hercules Coleman has called them out on Twitter. And okay. said, I'm not 100% sure about okay, these look, numbers. Okay, I look, mean, I, I, I'm going to give Taylor the benefit of the doubt. Okay, we, The problem with any comparison of salaries is it doesn't take into account net versus growth uh gross and taxes and living costs and you know there are very i mean there may be some commercial opportunities available to the top players in liga mx or maybe uh in mls there may be some other elements that play into what the salaries are so 
I don't know that Taylor was trying to deceive. We don't have a perfect understanding necessarily of how to compare these salaries. Right, right. I, I it was, but uh, I'm just saying if you're going to use that as an excuse why we're not winning it, you could, you know, you could talk about why we underperformed last year. There was three Central American teams that made it to the what is it, the semifinals or quarterfinals? Sure, sure. I mean, look. This is a this is a a competition, a very odd, strange competition. That there, there are only a couple of things that are relatively true, and one of them is Mexico dominates. Beyond that, everything else is sort of a crapshoot. Now this time around, four MLS teams made the quarterfinals. That's the most they could get into the quarterfinals. Good for MLS. The question now is whether right. they, they can go into the knockout rounds and actually do anything. And the and the problem, of course, Ray, is that MLS has to come out of their off season, get all ramped up. Try to throw together. Remember, remember, there's not. It's not just about we're not. We got to stretch our legs and get ready. You're putting together a new team essentially. You you have your core, but you're ro- you're rolling over your roster. You're looking to improve from last year, whatever that is. The team that qualified for the quarterfinals is a different team that then goes into the quarterfinals. Mexican teams, meanwhile, and and they roll over from Apertura to Clausura all the time. Have a little bit more spending power and certainly have more established, uh, uh, you know, a more established reputation in the tournament. The, the, for me, the excuse for MLS continues to be that gap and the offseason issues and going in the, the calendar, essentially, Ray. But it's, at some point, MLS, if they really care about this competition, is going to have to find a way to win it. I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yep, I would agree. All right. Uh, uh, we got anything else, Ray? But I, uh, yeah. Uh, I I just like to say that um, I think that we should really try to focus more on trying to get uh, our uh, top ten teams uh, with, with their market size to get these uh, more popular within that even those communities. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. MLS has not necessarily been selling out in Chicago, Houston. Absolutely. And uh, absolutely, uh, yeah, they, you know, LA fans they, they might announce to sell out on a Sunday night on a Sunday, but uh, let's be honest, in the earlier in the season, those tickets are just bought. They have those, they have the stadiums empty in Los Angeles. And well, okay, then, but yeah, if the, if uh, they, then, look, if the tickets are bought, I, I, uh, thanks to call, Ray, I got a bunch of people waiting. I'm gonna let you go. Okay. Um, uh, you know. Bought tickets versus actual attendance is is an issue people bring up all the time. This is just how American sports attendance is re- is reported. Uh, uh, you you can pick it apart if you want to, but it, it that's just the way things go uh, across all these different leagues. Uh, butts in the in the seats is a good thing. Tickets sold is about money. Clearly, um, let's go to Bill in New York. Hey, Bill. Hey, Jason. I was actually going to talk about the playoffs, but uh, I didn't want to get you off the expansion thing. Okay. What uh, what grade would you give our two new expansion teams this year? What 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 would I give them? What what kind of a grade would you give them? Oh, uh, I would give Orlando, and as you know, considering the curve, I'd give them a solid B plus. I mean, they dealt with a lot of crap in terms of uh, injuries and international absences, and they nearly made the playoffs. And they're not going to. They're still mathematically alive, but they're not going to make the playoffs. I think that's a B plus. NYCFC, considering all the drama and everything. I mean, they, they 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 sold so many tickets, Bill. They did great on that front. I uh, give them a C plus. Yeah, and see now, like with Orlando City, I, I agree with you 100. percent I think they did a great job, and uh, everything about them, I, I love what they did. And a new stadium coming on, New York City. I, I mean, I spoke to you about this before. I think everything they've done is wrong. It's completely wrong, mm. and it looks like they're going to top it off by firing yeah. uh, Christ. Yeah. Which to me would just be a disgrace. I don't understand. I mean, I understand. I understand how they might be able. They might reason out that he's not the right fit. But the, but but you don't go all in on a young coach with a reputation like Jason Crisis and then and then give him one year. You just don't do that. That's that's a that's the wrong way to run your your franchise, uh, especially if they decide to give Patrick Vieira the job. And I have nothing against Patrick Vieira, and I'd be excited to have him in MLS. Just not the ex- at the expense of Jason Christ with that team. Uh, it is important. I should mention that uh, our, our friend Glenn, uh, Glenn Crooks, who's up in New York, a uh, famous coach, guy who's been on Sirius XMFC many a time, has said that um, his sources say that Christ doesn't know uh, anything about internal discussions to replace him. So if this is actually happening, Jason Christ was unaware. That's, I, I, the only thing I like about New York City is Christ. I hope they keep 
you know. Yeah. But uh, I was calling about the playoffs, and I know we were all complaining about going to six teams last year. And I'm actually, I actually like it now. I think there's decision day. There's a lot going on decision day, and I think it's going to be interesting on Sunday to see how it all unfolds. Even though I mean, there's not that many. Really, only one team that has a chance to get in, other than like the teams that are all set. Yeah, I like it because I think it's a, a big difference between coming in second and coming in third. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it's a big difference coming in uh, fourth over fifth. You know, you get that home game. It's a big difference, obviously, coming in sixth over seventh. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of good points to it, as long as we don't expand it anymore. Yeah, don't stop. You I know? mean, and, and I, I, like we said, we just identify with Mark that MLS. I mean, with LAFC, Atlanta, Miami, and Minnesota, they're going to have their 24 teams stay. Stay at six each. That's half the league. Okay, we could do. Ha- I can feel okay. I would love it to be even less than half the league, uh, but let I'll be okay with half the league. Stay there, especially. I mean, and that's we're, we're still um, three years away from all those teams coming online. Yeah, and, and I like twelve because you know we're going to get to thirty teams one day. It's going to keep going. If you stay at twelve and twelve for thirty teams is to me is ideal. That's perfect. Uh, you know? <clears throat> so and I. Yeah, uh, Bill. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I gotta let you go, Bill. I got. I just got information that uh, our guest Andrew Orsati uh, is available. Let's take a quick break. Let's. I, I really want to have this discussion <clears throat> with Mr. Orsati about FIFA post position on the FIFA election. So we're gonna take a break. My apologies to Allen, Missouri, and Stan in New York. Hopefully, we'll get to you guys uh, next week. Maybe. Maybe later in the show. I, I don't think we have time today. Be right back, with Andrew Orsati. Don't go anywhere. During the past few months, we've created a new weekend tradition, which includes watching your favorite MLS team play on TV, muting the broadcast, heading over to Rabble.tv to hear my audio during the game, and then drinking a cold beverage as we spend 90 minutes together discussing our favorite league. For this Sunday, I'd like to personally invite you to join me and Jared Dubois as we bring you the final day of the MLS regular season. From 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern, Jared and I will be talking through the DC United against Columbus Crew finale, but we'll also be keeping a close eye on all of the other games, where we'll be updating you on the key developments as they happen. With Rabble, the concept is simple. All you have to do is tune into the DC United against Crew Game on TV, press the mute button, and head on over to Rabble.tv to listen to me and Jared on your desktop, through your iOS, Android app, or through your mobile browser. Plus, before and during the games, you can join in by posting your questions or observations in the comments section. And why don't you create your own broadcast call one of your team's games? It's easy. Sign up for free today and try it out. Join me and Jared this Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern at Rabble.tv, where it's your team and your call.
There we go. <laughs> Welcome back to Soccer Morning on World Soccer Talk with Jason Davis. All right, we're back on Soccer Morning on a Friday. Very happy to have with me Andrew Orsati. He's a spokesman for FIFA Pro. He's joining us to talk a little bit about the upcoming FIFA election and FIFA Pro's position regarding said election. Mr. Orsati, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, you know, I'm reading over uh, the write-up uh, at Reuters uh, regarding FIFA Pro and their position on the FIFA presidential election, uh, just to, to, to make, in the interest of brevity, and to, to get the message out there, what is FIFA Pro's position on what FIFA should be doing come February? Uh, very clearly, it sets criteria that we believe is required, absolutely necessary, to uh, source the best possible candidate out there. That is an impeccable candidate, candidate who's shown... Uh, a record when it comes to good governance, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to the ability to manage, change and lead a, a complex politically driven organization on a global level such as that as FIFA. And so we want to see that kind of environment flourish whereby if you were to apply to a normal uh, business, mm -hmm. because let's be honest, FIFPRO is looking at this the industry is big business. Mm -hmm. FIFA calls itself a non-profit, protected by Swiss law, uh, protected by so many other aspects that have allowed so much abusive behavior uh, to flourish in that culture of impropriety, which has just become so toxic, it's beyond belief, that now we are looking at it as a normal business, big multi-billion dollar business, which must be held accountable to the highest standards of transparency. And if you were in any other situation looking at a business, you would look for the best possible candidate, call it a chief executive officer, call it whatever you like, but a person who fulfills the highest levels of integrity, the highest levels of performance based on their track record. You are not looking for someone to simply mosey on down uh, you know, the garden path to continue what has been a failed past to maintain the status quo. You're looking for an incredible character. Human history has delivered such people. It is possible. Yeah. We need to get away from what has become, unfortunately, a very, very common way of thinking that, hey, you know, we can't aim for the stars. Let's not be idealists. Let's not even attempt to push the envelope. Well, in this case, FIFPRO today has shown clearly its position on the matter that it will not tolerate a candidate who mm -hmm. falls anywhere short of what is required to lead the world's most popular sport mm -hmm. and indeed to take us into this new era of reform that is managed professionally to transition and to make it the most uh, well-run FIFA or governing body of football, whatever you want to call it, in the world, mm -hmm. in all of sport. Andrew, the, the, the candidates that are currently in the race are all part of the FIFA system. By definition, they're, they're required to be because FIFA rules require a, a certain amount of time spent working in football. And then the nominations of, uh, I believe it's five uh, member associations. Is, is that candidate within FIFA or uh, within the structure already, or is it going to have to be outside? No, first, of all, first of all, we need to move away from the structure and what has been said and the criteria that's been set in the past and what applies now to a tainted process. Okay. Clearly, with all that's going on, investigations, some of a criminal nature, accusations uh, leveled at the organization based on World Cup bids and so forth, that even with a, a new task force, which has been poorly managed, underway, which does not have the independence it states it has, uh, that the new task force, which is involving six confederations, that's not independent. You can call it whatever you like. The fact of the matter is this, that we need to move away from whatever the rules are that have been set in the past and understand that the process now is tainted. It cannot work. Therefore, it requires a complete rethink of how we even reach a new election for a FIFA president, how we reach the awarding of World Cup hosting rights to certain countries, how we reach a FIFA executive committee and how these individuals are appointed. And therefore, what are the roles being played by the confederations and the national associations by being a part of this dysfunctional global structure where they are all part of a system that has led 
to these endemic problems of uh, alleged corruption and so forth. It's all well publicized. We don't need to go any further. Mm. So the, the presidential candidates, therefore, are being sourced based on what is a flawed model to begin with, whether it's you've been in the game for two years out of the last five, whether it's been this, whether it's been that. Forget it. Okay, we're working from the wrong premise. Mm -hmm. One must need to take a step back and look at the core failure. FIFA has to be held accountable by the players, by the clubs, by the fans, by the people. It has to be held accountable mm -hmm. because it is toiling with a system that has moved beyond what it was and uh, it, long ago. It has moved into a new era of commercial uh, of commercial interest that no longer allows it to be treated as it was in the past. Mm -hmm. And all the systems that lead to these elections, therefore, raise serious doubts about the manner in which we can continue leading up to February 26th. Now, if we delay February 26th, the election, we're probably delaying the inevitable unless we do what I was just uh, mentioning to you, going back to the core. So the system is wrong to begin with. So whatever we produce, it's going to be a problem because what we've said today, FIFPRO also is that we need a clean break from the past. If, if, if you look at all the candidates involved, we are not getting that more or less. And you can look into the, the history of the candidates. You can look into all of it. It's a, an important position taken today because we must be better than what football and its administration on a global level and confederation level and sometimes national level has delivered thus far. Yeah. We cannot sit there and tolerate that. It is clearly unacceptable for all of us. So we're looking to strike a balance that brings football back into the real world rather than think that it can be a law unto itself. It can act and not be held accountable and just continue to play with um, countless resources which are derived from a World Cup, which which is based on the rights of players, which works on the backs of the rights of, of, of the labor, which are the players, and that includes the clubs as the world. The clubs are the ones paying the daily salaries of players, and they're the ones providing those employees to these international organizations to play World Cups, to play for the Confederations, the UEFA Champions League, and to congest the calendar, to increase the demands on the labor force, which are the players we represent at FIFPRO. So there's this whole connection. We need to look at what is occurring here and start to get real. And, and us, as players who've been suppressed, who do not have veto rights over issues which affect players, right. the same way clubs don't, the same way fans are dismissed as a customer and are, are thrown away as though they mean nothing. No, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing stemming from the transfer system complaint that FIFPRO has lodged uh, to the European Commission about the movement of players and the manner in which football in these regulations governed by FIFA, again, flawed because of the structures that go to the heart of everything else that's going on in Zurich. Again, the, the transfer system is showing financial and sporting imbalance, a protection for the status quo, that the elite clubs are all, the, are all that the football world is about, whilst forgetting that those in the middle, those at the bottom of the pyramid, those who are turning up to allow Bayern Munich and AC Milan and, uh, and Manchester United and and all the clubs in the world who need to play against the daily competition in their domestic leagues before they go and take all the riches of a UEFA Champions League or a, another Continental Champions League. This is part of what we're doing. It's a broader argument than just FIFPRO representing players. It's a broader argument than just the people out there um, standing idly by. And even if you don't feel empowered, you can be empowered. You can come and support FIFPRO. You can come and support organizations who are working with us in the global union movement. You can come and make your mark, whether it's you feel a way to act, to sign petitions, to get involved, to create a movement that is understood, that is, that is very clearly set in a way that puts the football back onto a track to create an even better game, to maximize its position in social well-being, to maximize its, 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 even its, its uh, potential as a business its potential across many uh, many aspects to be a leader rather than what we have now where football is sadly trailing behind the rest yeah. of the world in sport. Uh, Andrew, um, the you mentioned accountability and, and obviously one of the issues for FIFA has long been oversight, that there, de there hasn't been oversight. Uh, it's only now recently with the investigations uh, by the, uh, the FBI and the P Department of Justice here in the U.S. and clearly Swiss authorities getting involved that we're starting to see FIFA held accountable for some of these things. Can the, can the players be that check? I mean, you mentioned that the fans and everybody, the clubs and everybody yeah. being involved, but, but clearly the players being the labor force that makes this game go have been yeah. left on the sideline for, for a long time. What's the fix there? 
Well, the players, the players are in an, a difficult position because of the way football is structured with regards to, you know, we're talking about a movement at a, on a global level. So this is not the kind of thing that happens with the snap of the fingers. But do you think it is possible? Of course it's possible. Do you think it's possible for us to mobilize all our members in countries where we have FIFA members? And that means a FIFA member is a player association such as the Major League Soccer Players Union or uh, in England, the English PFA or AFE in Spain or AIC in Italy. These are members of FIFA who do the job of organizing players on the ground. Now, that means... Can we mobilize players to take an interest when it reaches tipping point? Of course we can. We have the ability to reach out to our membership and do many things. That is what gives us leverage, of course. And in a, and in a normal world, and in the United States, if you talk about relationships between sports and unions, mm -hmm. we talk about it being a far more straightforward bilateral arrangement between employers and employee who enter into collective bargaining in a robust fashion. It gets ugly. There are lockouts. There is, there's this, there's that. There's, there are stoppages. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what you're doing is, is you are giving the key constituents, you are giving the key stakeholders in the respective sports the ability to negotiate and bargain over conditions that affect them. Football on a global level is completely twisted and it does not work that way. The governance structure is such that it's a pyramid right now, which has FIFA standing on top, followed by confederations, national associations, bodies representing clubs, bodies representing leagues, and then the players. Now, I like to think of that pyramid as being inverted because the workforce is so large that they're on top right. and we have the ability to make a difference uh, in many ways. And it doesn't always have to be by putting a gun to someone's head to threaten a work stoppage. But of course, when you are being forced into a corner, when the clubs and the employers, and, and I like to think of FIFA and, and the confederations and the national associations as largely employer bodies backing um, the clubs, uh, backing the need for competitions, which uses our workforce, they are competition organizers, these people who need the players to participate in their competitions and sometimes playing every two, three or four days. doesn't matter. And in the off season, going to play in Asia in in, in in competitions that generate revenue for, for, for different reasons. So, you know, every summer there's another competition, whether it's an international competition. And now UEFA wants to launch a new Nations League and they want to congest the calendar even more or put even more demands on the players to be expected to perform. So you realize there that clearly when push comes to shove, the players have, a, have an obligation to be educated by us and our members in the countries and then to take the action that they require. But the players will decide. We work for the players. I am employed by the players. Everything I do, I have to do for the players. I am not standing here today taking a position based on anything other than the fact that it's the players who decide. And we do that in a number of ways via global surveys, via a number of different uh, engagements with them every year, meeting with them once, twice, three times per season in some countries. So are you asking me if there's the capacity for us to mobilize our membership worldwide? Of course there is. Mm -hmm. All right, the last thing here before I have to let you go, Andrew. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly the, the transfer system. Um, I, I've covered it here a little bit, but to get it from you would be good. The, the challenge to the, to the global transfer system, uh, a legal complaint filed with the European Commission. Uh, what, is, what is the status of, of that process, and certainly what is yeah. FIFPRO looking to get out of it? Yeah, well, first of all, we're not afraid of a world without the transfer system, and what I mean by that is a world that, abolishes the current, um, the current pervasive and invasive uh, structure, which leads to an inflated market, uh, which is treating players as uh, commodities and assets that are in many, in many cases being switched between clubs um, without the players and the clubs really having much to say about it. And that's at the top end of town where agents are wielding extreme influence and so on, and also third-party investors who are who one, one third-party investor might own the leg of a player, the other might own the head of the player, uh, you know. Yeah. So it goes on and on because they claim to split up the economic rights of players and because they have an interest, these, these third parties and agents, to manipulate the market so they can benefit from the inflationary nature of it and keep moving the labour through the market so they can make a profit because they have to answer to their shareholders. Don't forget, they are manipulating the market. That's just some of the abuse that occurs where a, a select group of individuals are wielding enormous amount of influence over individuals, human rights aspect here, and clubs. So integrity of competition, stability of the competitions, all the points that are, that are laid out in the transfer system, 
whether it's competitive balance, whether it's uh, uh, the, the aspects I raised about integrity, stability of competition and, con and contracts, um, all these different aspects, we have been able to show in the 14 years since the transfer system was recreated in 2001 after the famous Jean-Marc Bosman ruling of 1995, which shook football to its core. There was a forced response in 2001, the so-called informal agreement between the European Commission, FIFA and UEFA, which led to the transfer system as it is today. It's been updated along the way, but it's more or less morphed itself into a monster. It has become harmful to the rights of players. It has come harmful to the rights of clubs who are shut out based on the, the financial yeah. and sporting disparity, that there is no financial solidarity. The solidarity mechanism that the transfer system is meant to promote is currently sending 1.84% of money through the trickle, trickling down the system to other clubs. So the money, 72% of the big money, is being circulated amongst the same clubs in the same top five leagues of Europe. So there is no competitive balance and it's growing ever wider. Are we saying that we can all of a sudden make Manchester United on the same level as the Seattle Sounders? We're not saying that. Right. What we're saying is, what we're saying is, is that there is a way domestically to close the gap between, uh, between clubs and to have far more stable ways of generating opportunities that lead to sustainable, well-managed clubs that leads to financial a responsibility that clubs are no longer speculating on the whim of the transfer market, which is rising to such a point that is now a closed shop. It's a closed shop and therefore anti-competitive, unjustified and illegal. The 14 years since the system was created has given us a body of evidence which shows that it is breaking the law. We, we let them break the law because of those objectives which they said were justified in the public interest. It no longer satisfies those objectives. The numbers don't lie. The economic research we've, can, we've put together through Stefan Szymanski, the uh, economist at the University of Michigan, he has shown us the way. But to be honest, he has just hammered home the po point that we already knew through available studies out there. So we know for a fact that it is failing football. It is failing the players. It is failing the clubs, the vast majority of it is failing the fans. And that is why people who listen to this program would do well to, to look at some of the things out there to understand it, because this requires the people behind their love for football to become involved and engaged. This will actually increase the sustainability of those middle clubs and lower clubs. It, you know, if you believe that you are selling a player to make a, 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 a profit that helps your compensation structure of, of feeding the rest of the club, it's a fallacy. The numbers prove it. So let's go back to the beginning, follow the money, let's get real, and let's find a balance. But let's also get back to a, a way where we collectively bargain the rights between players and clubs so we can reach outcomes similar to the ones that we talk about when we look at the US sporting structure, whereby we are being represented and having veto rights to protect the industry, the checks and balances that are sorely lacking right now at the highest level of the game, which is overseen by FIFA. Andrew Orsati, uh, Director of Communication Spokesperson for FIFA Pro, the Global uh, Football Players Union. Andrew, appreciate the time. I'm glad we worked this out. Excellent, uh, excellent information that certainly people should get involved uh, if they, uh, if they are, have an interest in, in the future of this sport. Uh, thank you very yes. much. Well, let me just say one thing, if I may, before we finish. We are about to engage in a, in a huge campaign whereby this will be possible for fans. This will be possible for everyone who believes in protecting the game for another reality and for a better future. We will find uh, a mechanism which brings everyone in under the one umbrella. Fantastic. We'll be definitely looking forward to that. Maybe have a chat about it when it comes to pass. Thank you for your time. Got to run. Andrew Orsati, good stuff from him. Let's Thank wrap you. up. Thank you. Br brilliant. Let's wrap up this edition of Soccer Morning on a Friday. Good week of shows. We'll see you guys on Monday. After Decision Day, talk about the European Weekend as well. See you then. Bye. Did my invitations disappear?